Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Leader Live session of the new year. Happy New Year to you all. I'm Councillor Patrick Harley, Leader of Dudley Council, and with me is Councillor David Vickers, who is evening. Deputy Leader of the Council. Correct. Many of you will remember the last time that we had this session, we had some really interesting discussions on subjects that you'd raised with us. We found it extremely useful to find out what's important to you and how we can help you with those issues. And as a result, we're going to try and make this a regular feature, giving you direct access to myself as leader of the council and other key decision makers within the authority. Before we start, just a couple of uh, bits of housekeeping before we start. Please be polite. We're here to help you in any way that we can. Uh, please be patient while we get round to answering as many of your questions as possible. I think one of the main concerns previously was that this is only for an hour and some people were still emailing questions after the Facebook session had concluded. Yes. If you do email those questions, then we'll try our best to get answers to you after the session has concluded or even over the next couple of days. Yes, I think that's the way. So, David, what have we got? Well, I thought perhaps you'd like to talk to us about the New Year's Honours list. OK. OK, we've had seven people from the borough who've been recognised in 2018's New Year's Honours list. Yep. Obviously, the first one I'll mention is uh, the former Mayor of Dudley, Councillor Steve Walthow. Yes. Uh, although we're on different political sides, uh, I think Steve's work for charities and for local communities has been absolutely fantastic. Outstanding. And whereas at the moment you seem to have politicians coming out of the woodwork at all levels, local and national, trying to do endeavours for charity, Steve's done this for many, many years before it was fashionable to do so. That's so I right. think this, this award, when I was asked as, I think it was as opposition leader, whether I'd support his nomination, uh, I didn't have any hesitation at all in doing so. I think it's well deserved. Uh, I think others that are worth mentioning, uh, David Harcourt from Stourbridge received an MBE for services to the community. Also an OBE was awarded to Robert Herman Smith for services to the global aeros aerospace sector. Mm -hmm. I remember the old Herman Smith factory at yes. Cinderbank where the, the bypass is. Yep. Uh, other nominees were an MBE for services to the Girls Brigade was awarded to Diane Seney from King Swingford. And I think we had three Hal Zowin residents uh, Mrs. Jane Clark received an MBE for services to vulnerable women and children, yep. an MBE to 96-year-old Derek Elton for services to sc the scouting and the community in Stourbridge, mm -hmm. and finally a British Empire medal was given to Judith Morris in recognition of her voluntary service to first aid and young people. And it, it's quite key that we're, we're mentioning these seven uh, people who've been awarded these New Year's Honours list because we don't have enough people from our area, from our community, yeah. who were nominated in the first place. Yes. So I'd really like to encourage people out there in our wider community, if they know of someone who has really put the time and effort into helping others within our communities, contact the local authority and we will try our best to support you in that nomination process. And hopefully we see more than just seven people from Dudley in the next round of honours being recognised for the, the hard work that they do in their local communities. Mm -hmm. Patrick, I know you're a, a big fan of football <coughs> and, and you uh, run a few football teams mm -hmm. and what have you. Perhaps you could tell us about uh, the Duncan Edwards um, exhibition at our museum. Well, I think it's uh, long overdue. Um, who would have thought that so many years after he tragically lost his life at a very young age that we'd still be here talking about Duncan Edwards? Mm, yes. Uh, the fact that we are just is a testament to really what a good footballer he was and really uh, talking to people who knew him at different dinners and award ceremonies that I've been to, uh, he comes across as quite a level-headed and sensible young man. Uh, and I think it's such a tragedy that he didn't live longer than he did. What a fine ambassador he could have been for the Borough of Dudley in the same way that... Uh, that, you know, Man United often wheel out um, Bobby Charlton as their ambassador. Imagine mm. what Duncan Edwards could have done for the Borough of Dudley. C certainly Bobby Charlton has been on record saying he was the finest player that he mm. ever played with. That's right. But, uh, several times uh, Charlton said that. Mm. And uh, listening to accounts from other people, that's, that's probably true. Yeah. Great tragedy that we didn't get to see more of, of him. Mm. Um, one that's close to your heart, Patrick. 
dog fouling in the borough. I'm sure you can tell us about the stiffer penalties that we're going well, to... Well, yes, we're, we're introducing uh, stiffer penalties for people who, who, whose dogs foul the streets. As a dog owner myself, uh, you, know, you have to be a responsible dog owner. Your dogs make a mess, clean, clean up after yourselves. And uh, obviously you continue to walk the dogs, but if they do make a mess, clean it up. Exactly. I'm a dog owner as well, and I wouldn't dream of doing... Uh, uh, just leaving it on the side there. Another thing, of course, they do is put it in the bag and then mm. sling it in somebody's garden. That's which possibly worse than just leaving the mess there in the first place because uh, in time it will degrade and, and disappear if it's in a plastic bag. Yes. Plastic bag's there for an awfully long time. Correct. Um, something in from the, the Coesley end then, Patrick. Mm -hmm. What about um, the temporary traveller's site? Well, the temporary traveller's site is something that the borough desperately needs. Uh, we are extremely vulnerable if we do not pursue this option and we're particularly vulnerable because neighbouring authorities such as Sandwell and South Staffs already have uh, uh, temporary traveller sites. So if we don't follow suit then it leaves us open to having more illegal incursions. The cost over the last few years has worked out at approximately £150,000 a year and that cost includes uh, going through the legal process to get them off our parks and open spaces. It also includes the cost of the clear-up afterwards. Yep. If all the neighbouring black country authorities in particular pursue this route and yep. we don't, then that bill will escalate and possibly double. So it's something that we have to do. If we don't, then we are left very vulnerable to even more illegal incursions. Yes, and it certainly has caused us a lot That's of right. trouble over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. We've got a question here, I'm not certain who it's from. Um, why are the cones left out and lane closures in place on the bypass island, Cinderbank Island, at rush hour, when nobody is working? It's causing absolute chaos. Oh, I'm having flashbacks to John Major's uh, clamp down on cones. Do you remember, th remember oh, that it? one? Yeah, uh, a long time ago. Yeah. Um, the honest question is, I don't know, sitting here in the, in the council house, the answer to that one. However... Um, I can endeavour to find out and, and get back to the uh, person who's asked the question. It is extremely frustrating yes. as a motorist myself when we are out and about on the roads and our journeys are delayed and we see those cones and, you know, for goodness sake, you know, they, we see nobody doing any work at all. It's extremely annoying and frustrating. So I, sh I, I share the questionnaire's frustration at that uh, situation. I gather that uh, the work that they're doing is actually... Um Western Power are carrying out repairs on the high voltage cables mm. in that area. Whether um, when's it due to be completed? I gather it's it's only sort of going up to the end of this week, perhaps. Okay. If, uh, perhaps Friday might be the end of it. Okay. But um, I don't honestly know the answer to that one. So if it f concludes, hopefully Thursday, then at least the questionnaire has got, yeah. got an answer to when it will be finished. So yes, that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, we haven't got an, any other questions coming in just yet, so what about um, the budget consultation? Well, yes, the budget consultation is currently out and about in the borough. I think it ends on the 22nd or 26th of January, uh, and obviously we're inviting residents to come forth with their suggestions on where we should pitch that increase on council tax this year. Obviously, the favourite route is, is 2.99. Yes. But, you know, we are open to that public consultation. Uh, we have real challenges on adult social care. People are living longer, but they're not necessarily health, healthier. As someone who has a very close relative, uh, my own mother who suffers from dementia, uh, I can't stress enough that the, you know, if, if we want to treat our elderly when they are at their most vulnerable and frail, with mm. dignity and good quality care, then that has to be paid for. And unless we want to go down the situation of a few years ago where families were selling their homes, using all their That's savings terrible. to provide that care, then someone has to pick up that tab. And one thing is certain in life, we will all get old. And I do not want to be running an authority or be part of a society that doesn't treat our elderly with that dignity and respect. And as someone who's got that close family member, you can't get any closer than your own parents, no. uh, I want to make sure she's well looked after. Yes. Uh, and I want to make sure other people's parents are well looked after. I know it's something that, that uh, 
our younger relatives are, are, are worried about mm. um, the fact that, that their parents are, have got dementia or, or in hospital the child yeah. himself might work miles yeah. away sure. and it's I something sure. we need to be worried about. Having this adult social care precept added that the yes. government introduced a few years ago has helped enormously in, in, in Dudley and it's allowed us to plough much more of an investment into uh, looking after those vulnerable adults than we could have done in previous years. Yes. Uh, so obviously part of that council tax consultation is about um, giving residents the choice on whether we invest 1% uh, of that adult precept, 2% or 3%. Okay. If we're going back to the travellers' yes. camps again, we've got a question from Jenny Walters. Why has Cosley been chosen for the travellers' camp? Are there no industrial areas anywhere in the borough more suitable? Okay. Um, Part of the problem is we need to have the transit site in situ before the traveller season begins, which is around May or June. Um, secondly, uh, Cowsley uh, hasn't been chosen. It is the preferred choice from the report that officers compiled for councillors. Yes. But it's certainly not been chosen yet. Consultation process is still live and has been extended till the end of January. If there are other areas that are more suitable, uh, that when we do the matrix scoring, score as high as Button Road, then we will give them serious consideration. As regards industrial areas elsewhere in the borough, there are other areas within the borough of Dudley, but a lot of them are not council owned. So without it being the site being owned by the local authority, that would entail quite a long legal process uh, where obviously the costs would escalate far higher than what they are at present. So to, to put it in a nutshell, the preferred side has to be something, one that the council owns, yes. so we can get access quite quickly and more affordably. Yes. I, so I hope that answers that, that yep. question. But they can still put, people can still yep. write in with and, an, and a suggestion of another side. I've met residents of Cowsley and I've offered to meet residents on a one-to-one -one basis yep. in my office. I've been to visit local businesses in Cosley to try and reassure them uh, of this process yeah. and other sites have been suggested whether they're suitable or not to be made to be seen and we won't know until the end of the consultation process. Okay. We got a, a question from a member of our staff okay. which says, what are you planning to do about staff morale which seems to be getting worse? Okay, I would disagree with that. I think staff morale, uh, talking to staff members is improving. Uh, we made a firm commitment upon taking control of the authority to go and meet all the key uh, trade unions uh, and also we made a commitment not to affect, to make any key changes, massive changes to terms and conditions. And I think that was a key turning point into trying to convince staff that we are on their side, yes. that we value their input Certainly into how we do. run this local authority. Uh, we gave, uh, sent a message out not too recently when we had the snow and ice on the ground where we congratulated uh, our workforce who would work throughout the night to try and keep roads free. So uh, I would obviously disagree with that assumption that the staff yeah. morale has fallen. I think it's actually improved since we've taken control of the local authority. I think you're right and I think our staff are our ambassadors Absolutely. to the members of the public. And if things aren't right and if the particular staff member has issues then they can contact us directly or they can keep it anonymously. I know you run an open door policy, so at any stage, anyone, right. anyone from the yeah. from the staff the, can come the, and see. There will you. always be incidents where staff members feel uh, that they're not supported, uh, that they're being victimised, they're being bullied. There will always be incidents of that in any organisation, mm -hmm. and this authority isn't different from any other organisation. But when that happens, I would hope that there's procedures in place to offer them the relevant support. And if there are individuals who feel are not being supported, then they need to contact the relevant people. If then their line manager isn't supporting them in that process, then they can contact one of the elected members, either myself or, or yourself as deputy leader of the council. Okay. And we'll endeavour to help them. Here's one that I was expecting to come in. Okay. It's from Christine Farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the green belt. I would like to know why Councillor Harvey, it calls you, mm -hmm. Um, supports the review of Dudley's Green Belt land, placing historic landscapes around the Halesown Abbey and Witchbury Hill Fort under the threat of development. Local planning authorities only need to review the Green Belt boundaries under exceptional circumstances. 
Since Dudley Council has identified a surplus of housing, which will take us beyond 2036, there are surely no such exceptional circumstances. That's not strictly true. Uh, we're having a review of the green belt in order to protect the green belt. If we do not have that review, then at a certain point in the future, the government of the day, whatever colour that government is, will simply turn around and say, when you say you do not want to use the green belt for housing development, they will look at your green belt review. If you haven't done one, mm -hmm. they will order a green belt review to be done. I would rather that green belt be done, review be done by our planners, our elected members, and members of our community, yes. rather than outsiders coming in and doing it for us. Secondly, if we don't do it, some very rich developer with deep pockets will appoint highly paid lawyers to work for them, and they will ride roughshod over decisions which are taken clearly on a political line. So I could get up now and make a very uh, strong political statement, we will not build on any green belt under any circumstances. And at some point in the future, some developer with a very smart lawyer will rip that statement to shreds yes. because they will say, you are not making that statement on planning grounds and needs. It has to be. You are making it on a political statement, and that is the wrong way to go. Uh, on the wider issue of the Green Belt Review, it is being done to protect that Green Belt. And I understand the concerns and I respect the, the passion that people have shown, particularly for this particular group, on trying to protect the Green Belt, and we actually support them. We but do. there is a process to go through, a proper process, and we will endeavour to follow that process and in doing so, actually protect the green belt that people are passionate, passionate about. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that green belt that uh, she mentioned is mm -hmm. actually in my ward. Yes, it is. Uh, and I've stood on the council steps and, and waved flags, and uh, I've stood in this chamber and said that we're not going to build on uh, around the abbey. Uh, so I'm glad to hear you say that. Next question was from Stephen Bennett. Mm -hmm. What is going on with Cavendish House? It's been empty since the 17th of November 1995. What is going on with it and when will it be knocked down? I expect at the moment there's a planning application due to come in to redevelop the whole of the Cavendish Quarter. We expect that application to come in probably in February, end of February. Mm -hmm. There is a bid going into the Black Country Local Enterprise Partnership uh, for the funding to demolish Cavendish House. Uh, the general consensus is that that funding application will be successful. I would expect by the end of January, February, for the soft demolition to start, that means that the boardings will go up and they'll start to strip the building. And then I would expect the absolute demolition of that horrible building, which is a blight on the landscape and yes. has been for far too long. I would expect the actual demolition of it to come in the second quarter of the year, probably about May or June. It was interesting to know that he got the exact date it was empty. Yeah, well done. But the, but oh. the, the, soft, the soft demolition, the stripping of the, 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 any glass that is re remaining in the building and anything that can be salvaged, that will start probably any time now. But the actual demolition when the thing gets blown up and comes, gets right to the ground, that will probably happen end of May, beginning of June. I think we ought to run a competition to who's going to press the button, <laughs> to be probably. honest. Probably. Um, another question from Steve Price. Will there be any increase in personal budgets in 2018? I take it that's personal budgets for adult social health care. Well, I think that, Without, that's what If, if Steve would like to email again and elaborate on that, then we'll yeah. try and answer that one. Okay. Um, John Gulliver. Mm -hmm. I'm from Dudley, born here, came back home, and now me and my children, ages three, seven, and nine, and we have to sleep in my sister's conservatory on the floor. Dudley Council think this is okay. We've been treated like we are nothing. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know from the... Is it a gentleman? John, or a lady? Yeah, John Gulliver. Okay, I'd like to know from the gentleman how long that he's been out of the borough. Obviously, we have a duty to look after people who are living in Dudley, working yes. in Dudley. Uh, a lot of local authorities, and Dudley is no exception to this. Um, if you have lived in the authority uh, for, I think, th three years... Yes. If you work in the authority, then you will become a priority for us to rehouse you. If you've not been living or working in the borough for a considerable time, then unfortunately you are not a priority. Now, obviously, people leave, they come back into the borough, 
Uh, there may be mitigating circumstances for this particular gentleman. Uh, if he'd like to get back in touch uh, and email me tomorrow, then obviously we'll try and help the guy out as much as we can. But there are certain uh, procedures to follow, and uh, several years ago now, most local authorities did put a, a, a limit on how long you had to be living in the borough to go on the social housing list, mm -hmm. and you either did that or you were working in the borough. Okay. Uh, but if he emails us back in with more detail, then hopefully we can try and help. Nudley, uh, another one mm -hmm. from the Dudley Town Centre. Uh, Mitchell Scriven, when, when are you going to start putting Dudley people first? When are you going to improve the town? Okay. Well, I would say that uh, from the moment we took control, we have started putting uh, Dudley people first. I get absolutely sick and tired of people saying that Dudley's best days are behind them. They're not. We've got the f 200 and million pound plus investment in the Cavendish Quarter, which will see Cavendish House race to the ground. A lot of residential and retail and leisure facilities replacing that quite run down part of the town centre. Yep. You've got a nearly 20 million pounds new bus and interchange that is due to replace the old bus station in Dudley, which simply isn't fit for purpose. Yep. You have the investment in the zoo and the Black Country Living Museum, which are world beaters as attractions. You have the £20 million investment in the Very Light Rail project at the bottom of Castle Hill. You have the new archive centre. You have the new uh, visitor centre, the Dudley Canal and Waterways Trust. And on top of that, you have the announcement that we're going to at last get proper con connectivity with the Midland Metro, Yes. which means that you will be able to get from Birmingham to Dudley, from Dudley to Briley Hill. And it is a key factor that we also want to make that final connection from Briley Hill to Stourbridge. So that means that the people of Dudley, for the first time in a generation, will have proper connectivity to our public passenger rail services, which is something they haven't, ha happened, haven't had for several generations. And that will be a massive ga game changer for the borough, because al along the route of that metro, you will have new residential build, you will have new uh, industrial units springing up, creating new businesses, new jobs, mm -hmm. thousands of new jobs. Hopefully the majority will be for the people of this borough. That's about putting Dudley people first, bringing in jobs, investment and providing affordable homes for our citizens. I totally agree with you. Uh, question from Steve Duckfield. What's happening to the old traveller site next to the new one that was built? Land just sat there doing nothing. <coughs> I'm not au okay fait with where the old traveller site was. No. So that... again, if he could, Steve could email back in with a bit more details, I can okay. try and answer that one. Um, I think this one's back in Cosley again mm -hmm. from Jackie Prosser. Why do we never? see any street cleaning in Cosley. Mm -hmm. The air is a complete mess with rubbish everywhere. I live in Hurst Hill yeah. and in the 23 years I've lived here I've never seen a litter picker. In the last few years the grass cutting of public grass and weeding has virtually vanished. Throughout the autumn into winter the leaves have been left to rot on the pavements which causes treacherous conditions for pedestrians. Is that Jenny is it Jackie? Jackie. Okay I agree with you Jackie. Um, over the last couple of years, the budgets for green care and for street cleansing have been cut, cut to the bone. And that simply isn't right because you store up problems for the future. And in the end, you end up spending more money to put right that problem. Upon taking control, in the summer, we decided that we would invest more in streets cleansing mm -hmm. and green care services. So there's £350,000 being put back that was taken out by the previous administration into ensuring that the grasses, verges are cut and maintained on a more regular basis, uh, that we have more street cleansing than we had under the last administration. Yes. Now, we will deal with those areas that obviously are showing signs of neglect first, and then I would imagine that we can try and do more as and when we can. But I want to send out a very clear message that we want to be proud of where we live in Dudley, and the surrounding neighbourhoods and we can only be proud of where we live if 
the place looks nice and is clean and tidy. So she has a very valid point. Yes, budgets have been cut in previous years. This year we've seen an increase in that budget for the first time in about five years. Yes. And I'm hoping as and when resources are available, we can do a lot more. Good, good. Um, Steve has come back to us yes. uh, about the personal budgets um, and said that it's about adult social care personal budgets. I thought, I thought it may be, I just wanted to confirm yeah. that, Steve. Um, there will be no, and it's not often a council leader can say this prior to a budget being published, but there will be no cuts in the budget, overall budget for adult social care this year in this authority. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there is more investment going into adult social care than at any time that I've been a member of this council since 2004. Um, and, and without playing the political games, we're very fortunate in Dudley. Whoever would have been running the council would have been fortunate to have a few windfalls. We've had the Better Care Fund, we've had the Extra Better Care Fund, which has provided £7.5 million pounds for us to make sure that as regards adult social care, we can put in that investment so that we look, look after uh, people who need it most and, and are obviously deservedly so. Uh, as regards to any increase in personal budgets, can't answer that here uh, without actually contacting the relevant cabinet member and um, mm. relevant officers. But I can say that they won't be reduced. Yes, that's, I think that's good. Having been the cabinet member Lovely. for social care yeah. in the past... Steve wants to know if there'll be an increase. I can't answer that tonight, but I can certainly find yes. out and, and I'll, get get back back to to. Yes. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you. Good, good. Um, doesn't seem to be anything coming in at the present time, so we'll go back to uh, our sheet. Is one just coming? No. no, no, that was Steve's. Um, we've done the Metro extension, dog family we've done, budget consultation we've done, we've done extremely well so far. What about community forums, Patrick? Okay, community forums, well, they're a good, they're a good means of local residents taking issues direct to their uh, ward members um, so hopefully uh, if you've got an area forum due to uh, be held anytime soon then if it's in your particular area please attend I find them a good vehicle for airing local concerns particularly if, there's a, if it's a crossover between uh, council related responsibility and also the police mm -hmm. and it's a good vehicle for the police and the local council to work together to obviously try and uh, aid local residents. Yes. So if you've got one, please attend. Some of them are poorly attended. In other areas, they're well attended. So we'd like them to be well attended right across the board. Okay, um, question from Richard. Off-road bikes are becoming a problem for residents on the Priory and Rensnest estates. Police seem to be powerless. <laughs> what can the council do? Well, this is primarily a, a, a police issue. Uh, and again, uh, I think this is a common problem anywhere where you have a lot of open spaces such as nature reserves. It's a problem in uh, Pensnet and Brockmore. Uh, and obviously knowing uh, Wren's Nest, the lots of nature reserves there and parks and open spaces. So I can imagine it is, a, is an issue. However, uh, it's, it's primarily a police issue, but it comes back to what we were just talking about with the community forums. If it's such a big issue, Go, attend the community forum. You should have poli a police presence as well as your local ward councillors. Yeah. And hopefully, by both uh, sectors, police and local authority working together, we can put in the resource along with the police to try and ease this problem. But it's not an easy one because when the police are there, obviously the, 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 the kids on the bikes aren't. Uh, so they always seem to be causing mayhem and havoc when there's nobody about in, in authority. Uh, and that's just the nature of the way it is. Uh, but by attending the forums, hopefully we can uh, try and address that issue. Um, Steve, who was telling us yeah. about the Travellers site, he's come back to us and said uh, he's referring to the Travellers site in Briley Lane, mm -hmm. um, which is Coesley, off Summerhill Road. OK, I'm not, I'm not aware of that site, so I'd have to go back and have a look, but I'm happy to get is back to it. Is that on us, do you think? Or? Uh, it may be just over the border. Yeah, I yeah. think it's. Over, I think it may just be over the border. I, uh, I must admit, I, so if it is, it's not our responsibility. Yeah. and that may well that might be a permanent traveller site. Yes. and there's a big difference on on, on the um, temporary traveller site. Uh, you can have access for two weeks at a time, mm -hmm. but you cannot come back any more than two visits, well, two fortnightly visits in a in a year. 
Yes. And there are heavy penalties. There, there's a deposit to pay of £250 per caravan, rental income of £80 per week. Those are payable up front. So it is not like a permanent site. No. So you need to keep the two very, very separate. separate. Yeah, separate identities. Uh, Pat Chambers. Yes. When are you going to start looking after the people from the area? There are so many in the area who have no home, but there uh, are loads of empty houses in the, in the area that need repair. Also, why have you not gritted the roads? The last few times we've had bad snow, and will you be gritting next time we have snow and ice? Yeah, let me deal with the snow and ice first. Um, I, I get this all the time uh, when I'm in local pub. People come to me and say, gritters are out, there's nothing coming out of them. And uh, we changed the procedure a few years ago. We don't grit anymore, we use salt. Yes. Uh, that's why these days you can't hear it. Years ago, you used to hear the gritter go past, and you'd have the sound of the grit going up against your, your car as you, you sped past yeah, the, the gritter. True. You don't get that effect anymore because we're using salt. Mm -hmm. So the gritters were out. Uh, I think possibly we didn't uh, do the PR uh, correctly, like say Wolverhampton or Sandmill did, but we ha actually put more salt on the road and travelled more miles in our gritters than our neighbours did mm -hmm. during the recent spell of bad weather. So we did, uh, to coin a phrase, grit the roads, although we used salt. So we did do that job correctly, and we did it uh, very well. And I pay tribute to the guys who went out in all hours, in all weathers, and worked through the hours, trying to make sure that people could get to work safely the next morning. Uh, but we did address the issue of snow and ice. Uh, I think our problem was that we didn't promote the fact that we We're did doing it sufficiently. It, I thought we did well as well. As, rega as regards to the, the earlier issue, um, um, the first part I think I've addressed about looking after people from the area. Yeah. Uh, as regards to people with, with no home, uh, there will always be a shortage of social housing. That's something that needs to be addressed. This authority uh, is building the first council homes. Uh, and it's the first time that, that Dudley has built its own council homes for a generation. Uh, and that's a, a, a cross-party approach. Uh, no party has a majority in Dudley, so we have to do a lot of cross-party working. But this council is building new social homes. In my own ward itself, there are 16 apartments being built. They are council homes, and that's not been done for a long time. So it's a small start, but we are now starting to address and we are starting to build new council homes that will go and replace some of the ageing stock that we have. Obviously, we're, we're losing 200 properties, uh, 200 homes in and around the Netherton area when the high rise to demolish there. Yes. And obviously they will have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's small measures. We can't rehouse, uh, we can't house everybody who's on that waiting list. But uh, I think councils up and down the country are now starting to address that fact that for too long we have not built our own homes. And it may well be that we also build homes for the private sector. We may build homes that we want to sell, homes that we want to rent out at private sector rates but we will also want to build council homes to add to our own council house stock. Okay. Um, this is from Jules McNeil. Mm -hmm. What is being done to help all the homeless people in Dudley Town Centre? It makes the town look a mess. There is a homeless man that is outside the bowling alley in Dudley Castle Gate every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, on the subject of homelessness, uh, and it becomes a problem when people start noticing people in shop doorways. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's not a factor that people in Dudley are used to. It's a new, it's a new issue. It's not yeah. happened in recent years. Yeah. But we're noticing now more and more people. Now, there is, I would be quite happy to state that there are no people sleeping on the streets that have not been offered help by this local authority. That's true. I yeah. think we have a very good homeless uh, team working in the council. The minute that someone is reported to the authority that is sleeping in a shop doorway or is homeless, they are then visited by the homelessness team and they are offered the relevant support and that includes uh, temporary and emergency accommodation, uh, whatever guise that may form that may take, but they are offered accommodation. If someone point blank refuses our help, there is very little we can do. On the subject of the, the, the uh, bags and sleeping bags and other mm. belongings that are the kept outside doorways, 
Um, that is off-putting to shoppers and to traders, and that is something that you know shouldn't happen. Uh, we, we are more than happy to help people who are vulnerable, who have fallen through that safety net, if they are in genuine need of our help and assistance. But at the same time, we also have a duty to retailers and to people who want to use our town centres that they don't want to have to walk past the eyesore that we've currently got in Dudley High Street. Mm -hmm. Now, there is a procedure in place, and obviously it has to be handled delicately, but those belongings can be removed, taken to a safe and a clean environment at a council depot, where the owners can then retrieve them later in the day. And we would hope then by doing that, that they have dialogue with council officers, and by having that dialogue, we can find out what their needs are, and then try and find them suitable accommodation. Because it's simply not acceptable for people to be sleeping in shop doorways. But as I say, if they continue to refuse that help that is on offer, then there's very little we can do. We can't force them off the streets. So. No, that's true. Um, this is from James Clinton. Yes. It's quite a long one. The land that was purchased going up Drew's Holloway, Hal Zoin, for the old dual carriageway mm -hmm. scheme, is there any way it could be built on? as it's a shame to see its purchase to go to waste. Uh, we need more affordable housing, and this, to me, would be a good choice for some extra council houses. Also, I don't wish to start a war in Cradley, but, what would, uh, but would someone be able to step in and force a compulsory purchase of the three very dilapidated shops? Um, those are the ones in the high street there. That, have been left out for far too long and would benefit from the community having them refurbished, open and trading. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with the last issue first on the compulsory per, uh, t uh, purchasing. Um, government has given local authorities more stringent powers to go and do compulsory purchase orders. Uh, part of the problem with that is that sometimes with the dilapidated shops it's very hard to trace ownership. Uh, there's one particular one that we're dealing with at the moment in a part, part, in part of the borough where the owner has passed away mm. yes, and it's either in probate or there's no clear signal as to who now legally owns, it. owns that premises. So that clouds the issue and it can be that by going down that compulsory purchase route and that legal route you end up spending a small fortune of the local authorities limited reserves. Mm -hmm. So we would do that as a last resort. Uh, far better to try and make contact with the owners if we can trace them and try and try and piece together bits of land so we can have a real substantial development. Now, not particularly uh, up to speed with this particular area, but if, if that area is connected to the first part that he's mentioning, then that could be a substantially new development. Mm. So it's about council working clever with local developers, with landowners, to try and make sure, and a good example of this is the Cavendish Quarter in Dudley Town Centre. There isn't one landowner that owns all the land within that Cavendish Quarter. Local authority, Dudley Council owns some. The primary developer owns some. There are little empty shops and houses that other people own. But by working together with all those partners, we're now on the verge of having a substantial new development there at the top of Dudley Town Centre. Yeah. So it's about trying to work clever. Uh, the, the, the earlier part about the Drews Holloway, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a great debate going on at the moment about the, the Black Country uh, core strategy and reviewing the green belt. If we don't use areas like the gentleman, like James is suggesting, then we will end up building on Greenbelt. Yes. So it is paramount that we use up all those, what I would call, brownfield sites first. And it's only by using sites like that, so he's quite right, by using sites like that we can try and negate building on the Greenbelt. Yeah, I, I know that piece of land that he's on about. There used yeah. to be a house on there, yeah. and that was knocked down when they decided to, to put the bypass in. And then they changed their mind and yeah. decided not to put a bypass yes. in. So it's, it's there. It's about... Half an acre, an acre perhaps? And the other issue is that landowners know that the value of land continues to increase. It doesn't go down. So some of them, if they've got deep pockets, will deliberately sit on land knowing full well that in five years' time they'll get a lot more for it than it's before. right, of course. That's right. Yeah. What we do as a local authority, we are a substantial landowner too. And we're now trying to redevelop quite large parts of that land. Obviously, we, and I can see where landowners come from, 
we do not want to redevelop every bit of land in every empty building that the local authority owns because if we do that all in the same time then the value dips yes far better to do it piece by piece so that we get the best price possible and obviously that money then is reinvested into local authority services certainly we could use things like generally garages that we that's have. right that's sites right. like that that's right i know that there's a, a house just further up the road from there hathaway lodge which only last week went in front of the planning mm. for, for it to, to be demolished yes. and the houses to be built on that patch yeah. Uh, I've got no idea what sort of houses. I mean, I mean co co coming back, back to the point, I mean, the, the affordable homes in my ward in King's Wingford South, it was formerly in Beach Road, there was a row of shops, there was only one shop left open in the end. Yes, I remember uh, that. Yeah. That lease was terminated early, uh, and it was held up for years because out of all the masonettes above the shops, one was privately owned. And it was a nightmare trying to agree uh, the final figure of compensation to the owner and when they dig their heels in and with the legal process it can take years to resolve so that's why sometimes these buildings are left empty for far longer than they should do <laughs> just come in about Hath uh, ah. Hatherton Lodge um, unfortunately we've, we've dealt with that one yeah what are you going to do about all the thefts and van thefts now that's an unusual one I'm for us I'm afraid that that is you know the responsibility of your of Westminster Police and not Dudley yeah. Council. Somebody there coming in. Um, John O'Dower. Why can't me and my wife get a two bedroom house? All we get offered is a high rise flat. Again, without knowing the, uh, the, the, the quite personal information, I uh, couldn't possibly hope to uh, answer that in full. However, th th there are certain procedures to follow. I mean, I don't know the gentleman's uh, the details and the, the finer details of his case. If he wants to email, uh, if staff could put my council email on the uh, website, then if he emails me the detail, we may be able to help. Okay. Uh, but I'll give you a couple of quick examples. If someone has been has terminated a private rented agreement, they could be in a three-bedroom property. If a homeowner wants to terminate the agreement and wants their property back that the current policy is that we will offer the masonettes first not homes yes the way that the housing rules and regs are viewed is you are making yourself homeless maybe for the no fault of your own homeless, yeah. but you are unintentionally making yourself homeless therefore mm -hmm. you are offered that masonette mm -hmm. now obviously there are exceptional uh, cases that come through to elected members so if the gentleman emails me with the finer details, okay. and obviously you wouldn't want to wear personal details alive on Facebook, but if he emails us in due course, then we'll try and pass him on to the appropriate people. This is, what, this is one you'll like. Mm -hmm. It's from Joanne Stedman. Okay. When will the leaders of all local councillors start to live in the real world and understand that the ridiculous salaries they get paid is where they should look to make cuts so they can meet their budgets? Why keep cutting local services if they are not willing to reduce the outrageous amounts they are paid? Even the Prime Minister doesn't get to run the country. Uh, stop getting rid of key staff and services and stop being so greedy and money grabbing. When, he says, when she says the leaders of the council, I don't think she's actually referring to you, Patrick. I think it may be chief executive. I think it might be the chief uh, executive, yes. There is no way that a leader, well, not the leader of this local authority, is on as much as the Prime Minister or even uh, a reasonable salary. Um, I think uh, local politicians, I think, of all parties, do a good job representing their communities. Yeah. And there's often a sacrifice there, either work, uh, family time, it all gets sacrificed to do the job. That Obviously, we, we have a love of politics, otherwise we wouldn't uh, engage and get involved in this. Uh, but I think uh, she's referring to chief executives uh, certainly not council leaders because we don't get no, we don't. <laughs> salary at all so uh, well, and in fact I've, I've had to pack in a full-time job in order to lead the council yeah. uh, and I know my predecessor suffered at his uh, day job uh, because obviously a lot of the, his time had to be spent here yes. so there is, there is a price to pay but I think she's referring to chief executives yeah. uh, do I agree with her um, some of the salaries are mind-boggling um, recently, they've, uh, the seven uh, METs, along with our partners at Birmingham Airport, have recently appointed a new chief executive to run Birmingham Airport. Uh, the salaries there are mind-boggling. Yes, they are. Uh, but it's, uh, it, uh, unfortunately, 
That is just the way of the world these days. Yes. But certainly councillors don't get that sort of money. Oh, councillors certainly don't. No. Uh, this is from Jane Poxon. There's a car dumped on council land near us, been there for over 12 months. Reported it last year and again this week. I will email weekly until it's removed. Okay. Again, if she emails in the details, we'll try and address that quite quickly. Yes. That should be an easy one to resolve. Yeah. The next one is about Lister Road. Okay. Uh, Paul Winchurch. Any decision on, Lest, uh, on Lister Road building on green space to create a super hub for council staff and vehicles? This will create much more traffic problems around that area, which is also blighted by Blackacre Road closures. Should have tried chicanes, as they have on the Russells Hall and Wren's Nest instead of a metal barrier, which has moved the traffic problem to all surrounding streets. Okay. Again, I'll deal with the last issue first. Um, I actually don't believe that the metal barrier serves a purpose. I can understand why some local residents would have wanted Blackacre Road sealed off uh, because of the through traffic creating a rat run. I understand that. A lot of that was caused by previous administrations across the political divide by closing off uh, 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 motorist access to King Street in Dudley. Yeah. King Street is now accessible. And I think with the redevelopment of the Cavendish Quarter, which will allow access, and for the life of I can't remember from which point, but it will allow an access point to the Dudley Southern Bypass. So suddenly the connectivity around that area is massively improved. I think at that point we should then look at um, that particular area again and readdress whether we need to go to such extreme measures. On the decision of Lister Road, obviously no decision has been taken yet. It's still going through the scrutiny process. Uh, there will be a planning application that goes forth and people who wish to object can object in the normal channels. Yes, that's, that's open to all of them. Yeah. Yes. Um, my, uh, this one's from Cotton Knot. My yes. real worry on the temporary traveller site is the cost to set it up. Mm -hmm. But then the visitors won't be interested in treating the area with respect. We don't seem to have an illegal travellers in Coesley, so why do you want to put it, the emergency camp there? Okay, I'll deal with them point by point. On the cost, yes, there is a cost to set it up, but we are spending £150,000 every year going through the legal process and then paying for the cleanups. And local communities are blighted because they can't use their parks in open spaces while these illegal encampments are in situ. That £150,000 will easily double if another black country authority goes through a transit site. And I'm not prepared to waste £300,000 of council taxpayers' money every year, every single year, playing the Keystone Cops, chasing people around the borough where we spend a fortune to evict them and they move 500 yards up the road because they know full well how to exploit the legal process. Yes. We spend a fortune getting them evicted from one park, they drive 500 yards up the road and illegally encamp on another section of our open spaces. That has to stop. On the uh, other issue of why it's uh, causally, as I said, there's a consultation process going on. That's been extended to the end of, end of the month. Um, all areas have had issues with illegal travelling encampments. And if you've been fortunate enough not to have it in one particular year, then that's great. But at some point, unless we take this action now, we are at risk of having far more illegal encampments than we've had in previous years. And I think we owe it to the, the duty of the people of Dudley to try and prevent that from happening. If we spend and if we invest in this traveller's site, and if it's not used and it becomes a white elephant, then as far as I'm concerned, it has served its purpose. It is being used as a deterrent to illegal encampments. And on the basis of what Sanwell, said Staffs, uh, Tamworth and Telford have already done, because they have these sites too, they have seen a reduction of 80% in illegal encampments. If we have that same level of inactivity, then this will have been a complete success. Yes, I totally agree, actually. Um, we've got here one from Andy Hale. Seems to ring a bell. We seem to have a rev revolving door with regards to senior posts within children's services at the moment. Why do we keep appointing interim leaders 
why don't stay, who don't stay long enough to see plans through. When are we going to get some people appointed with, say, a three-year minimum contract to take things forward? The honest answer to that is we live in a, a, a democratic society. People coming, they have ambitions. I think the days of having senior officers who spend 20 years with one local authority are long gone. Uh, you will get senior officers that come to work for an authority like Dudley, and unless they are really settled and really happy to remain in Dudley for 10 or more years, they will spend, spend three to five years and then move on. I, I, I can second guess the example that he's using there. Unfortunately, the person he's referring to was made an offer to be a chief executive at another authority Correct. that is very close to uh, his family home, and quite honestly, it was an offer that he found too good to turn down. Uh, this, uh, I think it's a lady um, who is writing in as a visually impaired person. Could you please get the bin men to put the bins back where they were left and not left in the middle of the pavement? Another thing, to walk into as well as all the pavements, parked cars and horrendous amounts of mm -hmm. dog poo on the school room. Yeah, a regular complaint from, from uh, residents uh, that, that I have contact with about the bin men. Uh, the bins don't get put back. Obviously, they're on a, they're, uh, on a tight time scale, so you can understand why uh, they get left all over the place. But they should be put back where they, where they were, and at least out of harm's way, so that people like the, I think that was the lady with, who's visually impaired, doesn't bump into them. So that's just common sense. So, uh, yes, I will talk to the relevant officer about that. As regards the dogmas on payments, if the lady uh, emails her local ward councillor, they will know who to get in touch to yes. so that we can have a blitz on that particular area if it's out of control. And obviously, with the new measures, uh, if we do know who's, who the culprits are, who the dog owners are, then we can make sure that the, the enforcement officers go out and hand out the appropriate punishment. Good. This one's about trees mm -hmm. from Richard John Cope. My aunt and uncle have been asking for years for, for the trees to be sorted out that are adjacent to their property. My uncle died on the 10th of December last year. Mm -hmm. Their two-car garage has been damaged and the side of the bungalow. Can you help pointing me in another direction within the council? Yes, again, if Richard emails me directly, either later tonight or tomorrow, I'll endeavour to put him in touch with the right directorate. Yeah, if he tells us yeah. where he lives as well, or where his aunt right. lives. We have the well. finer details, yeah. we can hopefully help. Um, this is from Andrea Raybold. Why is there more agency staff on zero-hour contracts than regular employees working on the refuse department? Surely this is not cost-effective and not fair on the long-term agency staff when there are obviously jobs available. I, I do agree with is it Andrea. Yes. Yeah, I do agree with Andrea. Um, some zero-hour contracts suit certain individuals uh, and that they enjoy working zero-hour contracts. It suits their lifestyles. Obviously, if um, you have a family, young family, you have a mortgage to pay, then a zero-hour contract is not preferable. You want to have uh, a regular income, set hours, a settled routine, and obviously, having that sort of contract does not provide that. In an ideal world, we would not want to uh, continue to go down that route. Unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world. But I would hope that as, as this authority uh, moves forward, that hopefully we can obviously address the concerns that the ladies emailed in with. Uh, but I, I do share the concerns. I've had family members myself who've worked um, in that sort of environment and one week they have two days the next they have five other weeks they're in on weekends and it's fantastic and the following week they have one day mm. and, and if you've got a family and you've got commitments you need it. that's not a regular thing. don't you it's not it's not good this is from the gentleman who's uh, written in before about mm -hmm. hutherton lodge uh, that's the one at um collie gate that yeah. i mentioned that the planning had said that can be okay. demolished okay he wants to know would you support its relocation to the Black Country Living Museum. It is an important building, has okay. got a heritage aspect. Again, this would possibly be an issue for our colleagues at the Black Country Museum. If that's something that they would be interested in, then perhaps we could try and facilitate uh, the start of that. 
Yeah. But we can certainly raise it with the, with the uh, board of the Black Country. If I remember rightly, region. it was um, actually owned at one stage by Noah Hingley. Mm. So it, it, it has got some local... has some historical yes. context there, doesn't it? So, yeah. Yes, that's something we can certainly put forward. Okay. This one's about lollipops. Okay. Lou Connop. How do I go about getting a lollipop, lady man, or crossing outside Dorleybrook Primary School? Recently moved house and school, and since September, I have already been run over, I've almost, <laughs> I have been almost run over countless times. I'm a registered severely and sight impaired. Okay. The process is contact your local ward councillors, uh, <coughs> and they will be able to take you through that due process. It's normally contacting ward members, gathering signatures on petitions, mm -hmm. And then the officials will come out and they will do an assessment as to whether there is an actual need for a school crossing patrol there. It's quite appropriate that uh, we got, we, you know, we've just had a big debate on school crossing patrols uh, and it's gone through scrutiny. They've made several recommendations yes, and right. I think that in time the council will accept those recommendations. But we'll go through the proper scrutiny process. But uh, obviously school crossing patrols are very important. We want to try and preserve as many of the ones that we currently got. I think there's a commitment to fund them for 2018, 2019. Yes. Obviously, a, a resident has emailed in about a new one, uh, but there is a due process to go through to try and get new ones. And she needs to, first point of call would be to contact your ward councillors. I know that, that we have had trouble recruiting lollipop um, mm. people, men, women, because it, not everybody wants no, to do that right. job. That's right. Uh, another one from Chris Derry. Are you getting another pay rise, or are you going to have a pay cut like the rest of us? Local elected members, local councillors haven't had a pay rise, uh, and we're not getting one this year. In fact, the elected members voted to have a reduction in their allowance, because we they don't did, get paid yeah. a salary, we get paid an allowance. Uh, as opposition leader, uh, my allowance as oppos opposition leader was untouched. The leader of the council at the time, Pete Lowe, I think took a 10% reduction. Yep. I thought it was only fair and proper that the leader of the opposition followed suit. So myself and Pete Lowe took a substantial reduction in our allowances uh, last year. All elected members also took a slight reduction in yes, their allowances. Is, yeah. uh, that reduction will not be um, reinstated until the staff with the Dudley Council employees start to get a substantial pay increase. That's good to hear. Uh, so we made that decision collectively across the political divide. So to answer the question directly, no, not having a pay increase this year. Okay. Oh, this is uh, one I was expecting mm -hmm. as well. It's from Gina Gigi. Okay. It says, what is happening with Dudley Hippodrome? Well, what's happening with Dudley Hippodrome is at the moment there's a process to go through where you have the Dud Dudley Hippodrome board who are at the moment gathering data and evidence to show that they've made substantive progress on the five criteria that they signed up to a year ago. Uh, there's a cabinet meeting in February where I expect a decision to be made one way or the other. So at the moment the board are work, the Hippodon board are working extremely hard in trying to gather all that data and information to prove that they've made substan substantial progress and then cabinet will meet in February and we'll have a look at that uh, data and information and we'll come to a decision whether they base enough progress to move to the second stage of this project or not so that's where we are okay. at the moment we've got one here another one from cosley actually sarah cotton not um has anything been sorted for extra parking for the cosley train station to stop cars being dumped now a little bit about this one um in that the uh train station there Travellers are coming into the train station mm. and leaving their cars there all day, which means the shoppers can't use it. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a bit of a problem with some of the traders blocking the, ex blocking the entrance mm -hmm. to the car park. I, I think this is an issue that we need to take to the, uh, uh, the, the combined authority and to the, 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 the transport people responsible for uh, the, the, the train station. And I think it's by resolving it at a combined authority level that hopefully we can prevent this from happening. I know you, you have the same sort of issue, not on the same scale, but the same issues in Stairbridge 2, 
with Sturbridge uh, train station. Yes. Even though you've got the overflow There's in, in Rufford. There's a thousand car park spaces. Uh, They're uh, all fully If full. you're not there by 8 a.m., it is absolutely full. Mm. So it is an issue that needs to be addressed. Yeah, okay. We've had quite a few coming but we, we, but just get, but we can't resolve that on our own as a local authority. We'll no. have to do it in conjunction with the relevant transport authorities and the combined authority. I'm not certain, actually, whether it's a, uh, a train car park or, mm -hmm. or whether it's one I think of it is. Ours. It, is. Um, it doesn't belong to us. No. We've got a few personal ones coming in uh, okay. about housing. Okay. Um, Gina... No, Gillian Zena Appleby. My brother had to move from his home where my mother had died. Council wanted to rehouse him, uh, and that they did. Meantime, he has been landed a £600 in debt on his new property. Why, as it took them so long to rehome him and couldn't pay him to claim council tax and rent? Okay. Again, some very personal issues there that we wouldn't want to discuss live. If the lady can email us, then hopefully we can get to the root of this. Okay. But uh, again, another very personal one. Another one um, from Paula Harris. Why is someone forced to move out of their home when the person whose name is on the property passes away? Uh, they're on about inheritance yeah. there. Would it not be better for the property to be transferred to someone else that has also lived in that property the same length of time as the person that passed away? It is not fair on the people who have been left behind and only have lost a dear person to them, but also their home, and they have possibly been in for more than seven years. I think due to the time constraints, we need to look at wrapping uh, this uh, particular Facebook session up, but I'll try and quickly answer that particular point without knowing the finer details, and I'm happy to deal with them if she wants to email him privately. Uh, but there are examples where the tenant who has the agreement with the council, unfortunately, passes away. They are then left with a, a son or a daughter or, or, or a brother in a three-bedroom property. We, we cannot justify, as a social landlord, having one person living, for example, I'm using this, that may not fit the, the, the issues that the, that the person is raising, but for an example, if it's a three-bedroom property, we cannot justify having one person living in a three-bed property. So they would have to be suitably rehoused somewhere else. Because, as we discussed earlier, we have hundreds of families that want suitable, affordable homes, and we have a duty to look after them too, but at the same time deal very sensitively and, and, and with a lot of sympathy the people who have lived in these properties for a while but may be better off rehousing, so be being rehoused somewhere else. Okay. If the lady wants to email us at a later mm -hmm. date with more details, happy to uh, talk to her or even meet. Um, I think we need to look at wrapping this up now. I hope you've found this as useful as we have. I think we've covered a far more broader range of subjects than we did in the first yes. Facebook uh, live session. Uh, and I hope that any questions we've not managed to answer this time, or those that may come up after this session has concluded, then please keep those questions coming in and we'll endeavour to try and answer them as best as we can. In the meantime, thank you all for taking the time to have your say and share some of your ideas and concerns with us. Dave's doing his promotion for the Hells Army countryside. Yes, well, I think you've been uh, maligned in some of the things that have. That, that have come out. About I've got broad shoulders. Said. But, Patrick, I am the ward councillor there. I shall be fighting for it, and I'm sure you will as well. Will that fit me? Yes. <laughs> Not so sure.